What's up guys? Welcome to my channel. Today we're going to be building one of the most insane and epic duck houses I have ever seen or built. My good friend Bama Bass reached out on building a floating duck house for his recently built five acre pond. If you guys don't know, he has a ton of wildlife in the area and unfortunately this means predators too. The main reason we're building this floating duck house is to give these wild ducks a safe place to sleep during the nights. Now, we can't just build any old regular boring duck house, so I went ahead and added a ton of cool features and a little bit of automation to make this one of the best places for a duck flying south. Now let's head to our local wood shop, get some materials, and start building. One of the first things I like to do when starting a new project is to model it in CAD. This is one of the first CAD models of the duck house. From here, we were able to come up with ideas for the type of features we were looking to see. The second CAD model is a more refined model closer to what the finished house will look like. I started this build off by cutting all of the structural members for the floating platform. These members are made from treated pine 2x4s. The platform measures in at roughly 70 inches long and 48 inches wide. I fastened these structural members together with 3 inch exterior screws. When assembling this platform, or anything really, it is important that it comes out square. I was checking for squareness by measuring the diagonals, which you can see in the clips. I ended up adding support braces as a temporary fixture until more of the platform was constructed. This allowed me to manipulate the wood without losing square. The top platform is made from cedar fence boards. I used a calibrated number two pencil as my spacer between the boards and I pre-drilled every hole before adding a screw. Once I had everything screwed down, I popped a chalk line and trimmed the excess off. The wood I am using to build this duck house is from Rough Cut Cypress from a local shop. The reason for choosing Cypress is that it will actually generate its own preservative oil which makes it naturally rot resistant. This makes it an ideal choice for wood for outdoor use. I am cutting these boards down to 33 inch length sections to make them more manageable to handle while going through my tabletop planer. When planing these boards down, my goal was not to make them have perfectly parallel faces, but to simply reduce the thickness from 1 and an 8 to roughly 0 0.8 inches. This way we leave some material for the CNC to finish it to the final dimension. The duck house is constructed of seven main panels, four for the walls, one for the floor, and two for the roof. I used a straight edge to trim just enough off the side to give me a straight, flat edge to joint with the other boards. This definitely would have been faster and more precise with the joiner or table saw, but I am working with what I have on hand. Gluing three of the panels together gave me roughly 33 inches square of stock. For this project, I am using the Typhon 3 Ultimate Exterior Glue. When gluing the panels together, I had to make sure there was a flat supporting surface on the top face that was clamped down. If not, the boards have the tendency to want to explode. quickly realized I needed more and larger clamps for this job. I am definitely not an expert when it comes to CNC fabrication, so whenever I am designing toolpaths and cam software, I always make sure to run a ton of simulations to try and catch any errors before ruining my stock. On each panel, I set the origin or the zero of the machine to be at center center top of stock. The machining operations for each panel took around one and a half hours. The main toolpaths that were used in this project were facing, contours, pockets, and V-carving. I used the 1-inch McFly surfacing cutter for facing operations, an 8-inch two-flute compression end mill for pocketing and contour operations, and a 90-degree V-bit for carving operations. I am using the Shape Oco Pro 4 XXL, so for anyone who has the same machine, these feeds and feeds worked well for me.
While I was already at the CNC, I went ahead and machined out the duck feet that will be used to trigger the splash pad. More on that later in the video. I thought this would be a great project to start learning how to pour resin. I came up with this hexagonal pattern for the floor of the duck house. This area will be covered by bedding, so that helped reduce the stress quite a bit. I am using the Artist Resin, which has a mix ratio of 1 to 1 resin to hardener. This resin is also outdoor rated and UV resistant. Why I didn't throw this back on the CNC and face it off instead of sanding, I don't know. Your guess is as good as mine. When starting to assemble the duck house panels together, I noticed that the fit between panels was very tight. So for each box joint, I took roughly a 16th inch off from each side. I opted for the jigsaw here since there was a lot of fitting up to do. Next project involving the CNC, I will know to increase the clearance between mating faces. Once all the panels fit nicely with each other, it was time for everyone's favorite part, sanding. I didn't document it, but I'd be willing to bet I easily have 25 hours worth of sanding for this project. Actually, assembling the duck house was one of my favorite parts of the project, but also quite stressful. I am using the same tight bond exterior wood glue here, and since I did not have enough clamps, I went ahead and threw in some brad nails just to hold everything together. The key here was to get plenty of glue on all of the mating faces. I ended up putting so much glue that I got it on my nice shorts. Yeah, my wife wasn't too happy about that. Once all the glue was set, I was impressed with the structural integrity of the duck house and didn't think it needed any more bracing on the inside. I did end up going back over the joints and any defects in the panels with this sawdust and glue mixture. It helped a lot with hiding any gaps that I wasn't happy with. The last big woodworking assembly for the duck house was the roof. The roof panels had a one and a half inch overhang to help keep the rain from getting in the house. This definitely would have been a lot easier with a table saw, but the circular saw and a straight edge worked pretty well for me. When assembling the roof, I got everything in place where I liked it and held it together with masking tape. From that, I was able to reach inside the house and fasten each roof piece to its hinges. These are stainless steel hinges, so they should last quite a while in the outdoors, and I went with three separate ones to better distribute the load. Since the roof panels don't open to a full 90 degrees, they have the tendency to slam shut. To eliminate that, I added gas dampers to each roof panel to help support it when opening and prevent it from slamming down. I quickly realized that if I wanted this duck house to be waterproof, I would need to seal off the top where the opening roof faces meet. I decided to go with this decorative top piece that was all glued as an assembly on one side so that once the roof is closed, there would be no chance for water to leak in. Once all the glue was set, it was time for another round of sanding. This time I went all the way from 80 grit to 220 grit, which is what I finished it at. Before applying any finish, I quickly built a box with removable panels to match the rest of the theme of the house. This box serves more as a utility panel that will house the electronics and solenoid valves for water control. Even though cypress will naturally last a long time outdoors, I decided to add a couple coats of tongue oil. This duck house has a ton of electronics and lights on board. It is powered by two 12 volt 7 amp hour batteries wired in parallel, giving us a total of 14 amp hours. We have sensors on board to detect temperature and humidity in both the duck house and the electronic enclosure, barometer, light sensor, a thermocouple for water temperature, and a bunch of relays to control various lights and pumps on board. 
It is important to note that everywhere I drilled a hole or set a screw, I always added a ton of sealant. The main brain of the electronics is a Tinksy 3.6, and before you comment and say this is way overpowered for this situation, well, there may be more phases of the duck house coming. The relays I am using are a solid state instead of the typical mechanical relays. The reason for choosing this is so that I can PWM the control signal or pulse width modulate. By using this technique, I have the ability to control how bright the lights are or how fast the pump rotates. See the links down below for all the parts I use for this project, and as a disclaimer, these are affiliate links. Moving on to the solar panels, I am using six 12 volt 10 watt panels, and these are going to be wired in parallel to give us a total of 12 volts at 60 watts. The way I mounted these panels were with these aluminum Z brackets, and I believe I actually mounted them backward, but by mounting them inward, it came out to be a lot cleaner looking. If you also look closely, I installed the LED assembly for the aquarium that will get epoxied in. The key with mounting these brackets facing inward is to super glue the nuts onto the bracket. It can be a little tricky to line up the bolts, but once you do, it helps with the initial threading. We wanted to add manual control for all the features on board and place an LCD screen to read out all of the sensor information. I took the enclosure front panel off and fixtured it to the CNC table. Running the program I was able to get all of the switches in a nice organized pattern. Doing this on the CNC helps because in CAD software I was able to play around with various button layouts. Before packing up and heading to Crimson Oak Farms we need to finish connecting all of the external devices to the electrical enclosure. Wire management is also very important here since there are a couple different voltages leaving the enclosure. We do not want to cause any noise in our analog or I2C signals. On our microprocessor, or TNT 3.6, we have GPIO for up to 64 digital I.O. pins, 22 of which have PWM capabilities, then up to 25 analog I.O. pins, and a couple different communication protocols like the popular I2C or serial. Digital signals are a true-false type signal, meaning it's either on or off. Analog signals are more of a continuous signal, and this microprocessor has a default resolution of 10-bit. As an example, our barometer and LCD screen communicate through the I2C bus. They are on the same bus, but they have different addresses. We use the digital output signals to control the lighting, solenoids, and pumps. The splash pad has a limit switch to detect a duct. This comes back as a digital input. And we only have a couple analog signals that are used, and these are to measure things like battery voltage and light intensity. Since our processor is only 3.3 volt tolerant, and most of our lighting and pumps require 12 volts, we use relays. A relay, in simple terms, is a device where you have a control signal, in this case 3.3 volts, that move a set of contacts. These are normally open or normally closed, allowing the higher voltage circuit to complete. The Tinksy microcontroller uses the same environment as an Arduino, which is a spin-off of the programming language C++. The plumbing on this duck house has a main pump that feeds a couple different solenoid valves that then direct the water in various directions. I think Rev2, the valve should be upgraded to servo actuated valves, that way we can save on current consumption when the valve is open. After spending roughly 300 hours on this project, it was finally time to deliver the duck house, and I must say the videos of Crimson Oak Farm don't do it justice. This place is an absolute wildlife paradise. The duck house is going to fit in perfectly. To make this duck house float, I am using 4 inch PVC pipes that will get fastened to the underside of the platform. Some of these pipes have threaded caps and this will allow me to treat it like a ballast and level out the duck house. You'll notice initially that it sits at an angle. The last couple things to tidy up on land were to attach the splash pad permanently and waterproof those wire connections. Then she was ready to go in the water. 
Once in the water, I suck the air out of the top of the inverted aquarium, forcing the water all the way to the top. I got my laptop out and downloaded the final revision of the program. And a couple quick things about the program. If the toggle switch for the LCD screen is on, most of the sensor data will cycle through on the display. And since we know the actual time using an RTC module, we were able to set times for tasks like water in the garden, daily pool cleaning cycles, and times for all the lights to come on and off. Another cool feature for you data nerds is every 10 minutes we log all the sensor data to the SD card. So roughly 144 data points daily. If you have any ideas for what this duck house is missing, comment down below so I can add them for phase two. As you can see, the fish are already big fans of the duck house. If you guys enjoyed this project, please consider subscribing as I have lots of cool and unique project ideas coming up.